Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you all had a delicious lunch. We're about to get started with our next panel. So I was able to float around the breakout sessions that we had just before lunch, and they were very invigorating, and there are lots of conversations happening. So I'm, I'm glad we had a nice long lunch so you could continue those conversations and make those connections happen. But without any further ado, I want to introduce our next, uh, our next panel that's coming forward, and that will be chaired by uh, Bina Venkatraman, uh, who's a director of global policy initiatives and lecturer and journalist, the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. So uh, without any further ado, again, I'd like to bring the panel forward. Welcome back, uh, and uh, welcome to those online watching and with us. Uh, we're going to have a conversation here about climate policy, and it strikes me that it's a really interesting time to be having this conversation. We just got a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Sunday issuing its direst warning yet to policymakers and to the public about the action that needs to be taken globally to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, if we hope to avoid some of the worst catastrophic impacts of climate change. We also uh, had an election on Tuesday that has shifted the policy landscape for uh, states, cities, and the nation, and um, a lot of opportunities on the board. We have a fantastic panel here today with us of experts uh, that really represent different levels of government and action that are required to move policy on climate change. I want to introduce them to you. Here we have Kurt Spaulding who is the Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency's Region 1, also known as the New England Region. Next, we have Brian Sweat, who is the Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space for the City of Boston. We have Dale Brick next to him, who is the Director of Programs at the National Res Defense Resources Council. And Noelle Celine, who is the Esther and Harold E. Edgerton Career Development Assistant Professor of Engineering Systems and Atmospheric Chemistry at MIT. Quite a mouthful, but I'm sure a very <laughs> distinguished and deserving title. So I want to start off by hearing from our panelists a little bit about climate policy successes. What has been successful, and why has it been successful, and what can we learn for the future? So Brian, I want you to start us off. Ground us in the city of Boston, which is right over the river from us, uh, and tell us um, what have you seen in terms of climate policy success, and what has led to that success? Sure, um, and I th I'm going to start with one that is uh, recently enacted uh, and really a baseline for all future policy uh, built around the principles of uh, we can't manage what we don't measure. Uh, and recently in, in 2013, uh, the city of Boston came the seventh uh, major city in the country to adopt a building energy reporting and disclosure ordinance, uh, which requires major buildings to uh, analyze, uh, collect, uh, and report uh, their energy use, their water use, and their greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis. Uh, and it's really built around the principle of uh, we can't manage, uh, and by we I mean either building managers, policymakers, uh, advocacy, uh, state regulators, can't understand what our opportunities are without understanding, first and foremost, at a, at a fairly detailed level, uh, where uh, energy use is happening, where greenhouse gas emissions um, are being emitted. Uh, so in Boston, it was a pretty uh, robust process to get there. Uh, again, we had a few other cities, uh, New York, uh, Seattle, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, to look to as models uh, to uh, frame the right policy framework in Boston. Uh, what we wound up with uh, was a major building is considered uh, any building over 35,000 square feet or 35 units, uh, regardless of ownership. Uh, and this class of buildings is about 2,100 buildings in the city, uh, representing uh, about 2.5% of the number of buildings in the city, uh, but it's 40% of our square footage. Uh, so for only you know, 2,100 buildings to have real data on 40% of the square footage in Boston is absolutely critical to developing the next generation of policies around climate change. Uh, buildings in Boston are responsible for about 70% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, given uh, the strong use of mass transit, uh, about 52% is commercial buildings and 18% is residential buildings. Uh, so uh, happy to report, and we had a phase rollout uh, this past uh, September was the first 
uh, deadline for large commercial buildings, so it was buildings over 50,000 square feet. Uh, we had over 750, actually as of today, it's over 800 buildings report uh, and over 150 million square feet. Uh, so whereas a year ago, if we had a conversation on building specific information and being able to drive climate policy, I had data on 0% of Boston square footage. Today I have data on 25% of our square footage, understanding the emissions profile, the energy profile uh, from all fuel sources in a building uh, and allowing us to develop uh, proactive policies and programs. There is a requirement uh, going forward that all buildings uh, once every five years that are not top performers or showing a 15% improvement over that five years in greenhouse gas emissions uh, conduct uh, an energy efficiency audit or action. Uh, so there is a continuous improvement mechanism built into the, uh, the reporting uh, requirements. Uh, also happy to report that um, shortly thereafter, Cambridge, I know, passed a similar ordinance this past spring uh, and have uh, spoken to colleagues in Burlington and elsewhere in New England. Uh, and this is becoming uh, a, a nice pathway for cities, which have varying degrees of control throughout the country, to do something very concrete, very specific, uh, to get the information necessary to take real action uh, in our own backyards on climate. So Brian, how did you do this? How did you get the cooperation you needed from the building sector, from the private sector, and from the different constituents across the city to get this done? And what could we learn about from that? So there was a lot of engagement uh, with the private sector, in particular commercial real estate owners. I actually come from that background and was actually able to work on this policy from the outside and then um, come into it uh, while, uh, when I joined City Hall in 2012. Uh, this was actually in our 2011 Climate Action Plan uh, as a policy uh, to be explored. Uh, and there were a number of working groups pieced together uh, with uh, real estate organizations. A Better City played a critical role. The Green Ribbon Commission, which is a uh, civic and private sector leadership group around climate action, played a critical role. Uh, so there were no surprises at the end of the day. Uh, and I think uh, agreeing very quickly on the principle of measurement and disclosure as a mechanism to motivate behavior change uh, was something that everybody could get behind. Okay, great. So we've got some insights here. No surprises and using broker uh, civic organizations to help uh, forge agreement, engaging early, and agreeing on principles. Those are great insights. Um, I want to turn to Dale Brick, and sorry I got tongue-tied for a second when I was introducing okay. you. Of course, the National <laughs> Resources <laughs> Defense Council is a very preeminent organization and uh, mixed up the order of the, the words in that name. But Dale, you have had um, quite an impact working on the regional level. Uh, tell us about how the climate policies you've worked on the regional level surrounding cap and trade and mitigation of carbon dioxide emissions uh, have been rolled out and what, what can we learn from that process that could help us in the future? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one of the biggest successes in this area is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is an effort uh, among originally 10, now nine states in the Northeast Maine to Maryland. Um, we can talk about New Jersey during the Q&A if you like. Uh, and these states decided to get together and work at a regional level because all of them were thinking about doing a climate policy and they realized and their constituents told them that they would uh, much prefer to work at a regional level because energy markets are regional, uh, economies of scale, uh, and you know already you're trying to tackle a global problem, so you really want to take the biggest chunk and create a model um, that could work in other areas. So uh, regional approach made a lot of sense. It also made it a much larger task because the states had to negotiate with each other in addition with all the different stakeholders involved um, negotiating with one another. So of course you had um, the owners of the power plants. This, this effort is focused on capping carbon dioxide pollution from power plants, so it's just limited to that one sector. Um, so you have the owners of the power plants, you have the utilities, which is largely overlapping, but not entirely. Um, you have the environmental community, consumer advocates, both regular consumers like us and large industrial customers, um, the clean energy business folks, uh, so a very large cast of characters. It was a huge multi-party negotiation that went on for multiple years. Uh, but the end result was um, very successful in the sense of the infrastructure that, that people negotiated and how solid that was, um, although uh, the cap itself was originally actually above emissions, so not really doing its job, but the states have since fixed that. So uh, what we have is a regional cap. Each state has their sort of apportionment of the pollution permits or allowances that are divided uh, 
uh, across the region, but they sell those pollution permits into a common marketplace quarterly through a regional auction process. And then they use the proceeds from those auctions. Overwhelmingly, the states have discretion, but they overwhelmingly use those proceeds to drive investment in energy efficiency and renewables. So it creates this sort of virtuous cycle where you're um, investing in resources that will keep the cost of meeting the cap as low as possible and also expedite the transition to the clean energy infrastructure that you want uh, more quickly than would happen without this policy. And so the end result has been emissions are lower, 30% down, energy bills are lower because you're investing in energy efficiency which lowers energy, everyone's energy bills that also puts downward pressure on prices but energy prices are different than bills and we could talk about that more in the Q&A too if people are interested in it. And it's also been a huge job creator. So if you think about where our energy dollars go when you pay uh, your monthly bill to your utility, that those dollars are going mostly to power plants Sometimes they're in your state, sometimes they're not. And the power plant is spending a lot of that money on fuel, and almost all of that money goes out of the region. And then power plants themselves are not very labor-intensive um, investments in the economy. If you think about a fossil fuel power plant, it's a giant furnace that burns rocks. This is not 21st century technology, and it doesn't take a lot of people to do that. And if you think about energy efficiency, where you're sending people into every home, office, factory to make the lighting better, the heating and air conditioning systems, the windows, that's hugely labor intensive. So you're shifting from sending a lot of your energy dollars out of state to investing in the local economy in a job creating machine. And the fact that the states have been able to do this and sort of show those results has been so valuable as now we're trying to uh, build a system at the federal level that will uh, cap carbon pollution in the smartest, least cost way, driving these same kind of collateral benefits. It just gives the lie to the naysayers who are like, job killing energy tax, or um, literally the coal industry folks came up to Massachusetts during the process of negotiation saying that this would be the end of Western civilization as we know it. And this is a direct <laughs> quote from the coal industry lobbyist. Because if you kill coal, you'll actually kill the railways because the railways rely on delivering coal to power. I mean, they had this song and dance routine that was just um, truly unbelievable to hear. But it just doesn't hold water when you can actually show in real life what's happening in these states. Um, that, that's the opposite of that. How, how important was it to do this at the regional level as opposed to state by state? We know California had a model. How important was it for creating those efficiencies, creating jobs, all the, the principles you kind of outlined? Yeah, I think it's critical and we're actually seeing, at the time the states did modeling to show those benefits and we're seeing that now um, in anticipation of the carbon pollution standards coming down the line from EPA, that the re energy markets are regional for the most part. I mean, New York has its own independent system, they're called independent system operators, the, the energy market, but New England is one, PJM, which is Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and sort of expanding into the rest of the world. So these energy markets are regional, so you really want to have your approach to, this is basically an energy policy, align with that so that people are doing things in a consistent way that don't create perverse impacts uh, in those energy markets. You want them to function properly uh, and not throw a wrench in the works. Obviously, there's economies of scale. But there are also issues with, if you want to drive investment in the least cost solutions like energy efficiency and you want to be building um, the renewable energy infrastructure for the long term, those markets are also regional. So if you have a, um, a regional policy, you don't, you can create something that's simple. The way the, the northeastern states um, did this, there's a pollution cap, you sell the permits, you have the proceeds, you just invest in the smartest way that you don't have to convert every high efficiency washing machine into a tradable energy efficiency credit. You don't have to track every kilowatt hour from a wind farm in another state to the, pol you know, the state that has the policy. So it's much easier to develop something that's simple than if it's simple, it's less likely to you know, get screwed up in various ways. And also people can understand it. Um, so I think it's hugely valuable to approach these things at the regional level. 
Great, thank you. I think we're going to want to come back to this uh, question of, you know, where does it make sense to have regional versus national policy for these kinds of problems? And I think that you set up the stage for that really well. Kurt, I'd love to turn to you and ask you to tell us a little bit about uh, the success of the Clean Power Plan, um, the proposed rules, and um, how exactly this, uh, this rollout, which I understand is a first step, uh, mm -hmm. uh, can point us the way forward. Well, I'm glad you're optimistic. Have to be. <laughs> Have to be. So do I. I'm optimistic because the response to the Clean Power Plan has been actually very positive across the country, notwithstanding the rhetoric you hear um, from certain quarters of Congress or certain quarters of the, the country. Um, we are talking about a disruptive event when it comes to the economy. Whenever you do disruptive things, there are great challenges, and that's always been the case in this country when you talk about things that disrupt the economy, like the railroads was very disruptive, or the automobile was very disruptive. So this is disruptive, and we have to acknowledge that, and, and, and there is controversy around that. Um, what is the Clean Power Plan, first of all? I think I should answer that. Um, essentially, it's, it's, a direct, it's a part of fulfilling a directive the president gave all the federal agencies, something called the President's Climate Action Plan. He stood up in a very hot day in front of Georgetown and spoke for nearly an hour uh, over a year ago um, and really directed EPA and the federal agencies to take action on climate. And that involved both mitigation of climate and adaptation of climate. And there's policy underway in both sides of that equation, and EPA is involved in both of that. Um, the, the Climate Action Plan, the, the, the Clean Power Plan, um, is actually a, a use of the Clean Air Act um, grounded in the idea that carbon dioxide uh, emitted in excess is, is a pollutant. Um, it literally endangers human health. And, and we need to be very clear about that because uh, some would argue it's, it's energy policy, and it's not. It, it's, about it's about protecting human health. It comes back to the core authorities EPA has. It's not a new authority. Um, we're using a section of the act called 111D and 111B. 111B talks about new power plants and sets a standard, essentially a technology standard. So if you're going to build a new power plant today, you, you basically have to meet the performance level of the most advanced gas plant, uh, gas plants that are being built, air-cooled uh, combined cycle plants. Um, 111D is the one that's drawing a lot of uh, uh, drawing a lot of interest right now, and an unprecedented rollout of, of and community engagement all over the country, meetings upon meetings upon meetings. But there's a couple of things you need to remember about it. It's grounded in the experiences you just heard about. Um, the fact that at city and state levels and regional levels, well, we have seen dramatic reductions in carbon emissions uh, when you get the incentives right. Um, it's grounded in the idea of cooperative federalism. The states would actually make plans to implement 111D. And it's grounded in that we can set uh, a, cons a consistent method for setting targets for each state that respect where each state is in the capability when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. So I've been laughed at, but I think it's a pretty good, pretty good character, uh, characterization. If you look at New England, you look at someone like Brian, who's doing what he's doing, or you look at uh, what the state of Massachusetts is doing, or, or the rest of the states, you could characterize us as in pretty good shape to reduce carbon emissions. Literally, we're conditioned to do it. You could go to another state, and I would characterize them as couch potatoes. They've, they've not done their miles. They're, they're not ready to do much. So their, their plan or their emissions uh, expectation is, is more modest because they have to do a lot of work to get even that first big, big increment. So this, this plan is, is grounded in where states are and what they can do. And then the, the final principle that I think is, is really, really important is it's grounded in that it's economically sensible to do this. Um, our benefit cost analysis on this is, is very promising. We think it would cost in the neighborhood of eight billion, seven to nine billion dollars to do this. We should see returns to the economy in the neighborhood of 50 to, to 90 billion dollars. So we're, we're making a very strong case that the economics in this are, are, are very, very positive. Um, in the end of the day, um, states will need to do this. 
It's, it's much different than most of what EPA does, where we set a standard and everybody has to get to this standard. Each state gets to make a plan that will meet a carbon intensity goal. And in the end, they get a great deal of flexibility in meeting that goal. Um, we're working on, or we've gotten a tremendous amount of feedback on some of the challenges of making such a flexible system work. But we're in that phase right now, and it's actually been, as I said, a very constructive dialogue. Um, now things have changed as of yesterday. So we will see uh, whether this, this policy, which again has been uh, generally embraced in, in most, most places, um, is, is now politicized to the point we have serious, serious challenges. We don't think it's a political point. We, we think this is a point of necessity to move forward. As, as was said, this will address about 32% of the carbon emissions in the country. The, emissions coming from uh, big, big energy, we call EGUs, electrical generating units around the country. Um, but we're very encouraged that this, this could be a, a game changer. The way it's been described, and I think this is really important, um, this won't solve the carbon emissions problem. To get to the 2050 goal, you're going to have to do more than this. But what we need to do is start walking that path, and, and then let the public come around on the notion that walking this path kind of what we all know already up here in New England and, and in the Northeast, is not great sacrifice. Instead, it's great opportunity. And when we get the whole country walking this way, um, we're very hopeful that the next increment or big, big step on reducing carbon emissions would be, would be much more politically doable going forward. And, and I, at my, my closing point, you talked about successes. I would be hesitant, I need to say that in the first term, we did get some things done. Things like mileage standards on vehicles. We've now we're, we're about to do our heavy, heavy duty truck standard, never been done before. Um, the the relationship with the auto industry and their orientation to reducing uh, carbon emissions has been radically changed in the first term. Um, probably even before the first term, notions of a renewable tax credit, which is in, in danger now to advance the development of the new, renewable industry. That's all was done. So there, there's a lot already out there, but I think this Clean Power Plan kind of pulls it all together in a, in a set of incentives that can take, take advantage of all the tools that, that, are, that have been developed. That's great. I love this framing of the regulations as the, the rules as an opportunity really for innovators to come in. And I think we've seen that when you look at the fuel emission standards from 2009 and the doubling of the fuel emission standards around light vehicles the range of hybrid and electric vehicles that have come to the market in response to those regulations. I think we have a similar opportunity when it comes to the power plant rules that are rolling forward. I want to turn to Noelle. Uh, Noelle, we know that we don't have a global climate change treaty so that you, you don't have something to chalk up uh, as, as a victory in terms of that arena. We're all looking forward to the Paris negotiations in 2015 where the conference of parties will come together and hopefully uh, set ambitious goals for, uh, for climate change and make plans to, to make uh, headway towards them. Uh, what's your assessment of where we are now and what are the, what are the um, I guess, success stories from the international environmental arena that you think might be instructive for the path forward for Paris? Great. Well, as you said, um, and climate is a global problem. So if we're actually going to solve this problem, we're going to need not only these local, regional, and national initiatives, but we're going to need corresponding initiatives in all of the different countries in the world, because what really controls the problem is the amount of greenhouse gases entering the global atmosphere. And Bina, as you said, we do not have a global um, climate agreement that will do that yet. Um, but I think there are some instructive um, relative successes. Um, you know, it's a really big challenge to get all of the countries in the world of all of the different um, domestic constraints to agree to a set of policies. Um, the other panelists have talked about um, some of the challenges, even just in a domestic context, that involve when you're working with industry, when you're working with different regions. And each country has that domestically and then has to then agree with other countries. So everything that's going on in the US goes on in, in European countries, goes on in China, goes on in India in terms of balancing the different domestic issues. So you have a lot of complexity. And with all that, you might think, well, it's completely impossible 
to come to any sort of global agreement on a global treaty. And I think there's a lot of pessimism that a global treaty on environmental issues really isn't possible. The example that everyone gives historically of the world coming together um, as a global, um, global community to address an environmental issue um, is likely the Montreal Protocol is looked at as the big global environmental success story, um, reducing uh, chlorofluorocarbons, protecting the global ozone layer. But that happened in the mid 80s. And for a lot of the students in the audience, that's before you're born. Um, it was a long time ago, global, um, global issues, um, global geopolitics has changed. And it's easy to look at the climate change agreement and say, well, you know, it's impossible to come together on a global environmental issue today. And it's impossible for the US to participate in that. Well, the example that I give to think about that in a, in a more positive way is um, the recent agreement on global mercury pollution. Um, not a lot of people have uh, talked about this, um, but it, was, it is the newest global environmental treaty. It was agreed in 2013. And um, countries around the world came together and agreed that mercury is a global problem and that steps can be taken to reduce the amount of mercury emissions um, to the atmosphere. Now, it's a smaller problem, granted, um, but the first uh, party to that agreement was the United States. And that's because the United States was able to take a leadership role based on some uh, domestic uh, policies that it had put into place. Um, and that really gives me the sense that it is possible for countries to work out these, these differences. Uh, the global environment is not a concept that has gone away from the mid 80s and it's impossible to come to an agreement on a, on a global environmental issue. Um, it's really the only way we can get to anything that's going to monitor and verify and um, account for all of the greenhouse gases that are going into the global environment, which is the scale of the climate problem. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a difficult challenge. Um, you can think about different ways, and we can talk in the Q&A about different ways and different other potential pathways that can complement a uh, global agreement. Uh, but looking forward towards Paris, getting to some creative solutions that will enable an agreement and enable major countries to be on board, um, I think is, it's, a, it's a steep path, but I think we have to do it at this point. Noel, how is the global community looking at things like the Clean Power pl Plan in the US and some of the other initiatives that are springing up? Um, how, I guess, how is that playing from your point of view in the conversation about uh, moving towards a global treaty or accord? Well, I think it's pretty clear that if we're going to have uh, it, actual global action, the US has to be out there with domestic um, policy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the US needs to be on board, and the Clean Power Plan is the way that the US is, is implementing uh, CO2 policy. Um, so I ways, think it's, yeah. and you know, it's, it's a step. It's, it's something that can be, you know, it's, it can be in the domestic legal framework. Um, you see China also moving towards more domestic action mm -hmm. that um, is looking towards uh, things that are energy efficient, things that are more climate friendly. So you do see movement in some of these major emitters, which is really a precursor to getting things agreed uh, on right. the international Are they level. responding to each other? Or are they responding to internal pressure? How much are they reacting to each other's moves in terms of the chess game of trying to get emissions reductions? Well, I don't think so you could argue that the U.S. policy is driven by China. Um, the U.S. <laughs> policy is driven by the global climate problem, and I think right. everyone is really thinking, thinking about that. Um, right. In terms of the global negotiations, obviously there are, um, with respect to um, you know, what ends up in a Paris Agreement or not, obviously countries will respond to each other in that context. But um, as we saw from this panel, this is really a grassroots effort. Uh, you have people in cities, you have people in regions, you have people in different countries really responding to the problem of climate. And I think that's consistent with the kinds of solutions that have come in here and in the collab context. Okay, great. This is turning out to be a lively group. Okay, I'm excited to hear <laughs> a little bit more about how you think we can overcome the barriers and challenges we face. Um, so we've heard about a few of these success stories at different levels, um, some tepid success story, uh, but at least at the beginnings of success. Um, 
And I want to hear about what it takes in terms of uh, specific examples of challenges you've overcome, either in bringing those policies to the fore or ways that you might overcome the challenges we face on the road ahead. For all of us? All of you. All you can start, you. though. You, 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 Kurt, you told us about some very specific challenges you're going to anticipate. Yeah, no, I think we, you're anticipating lawsuits, we, but we, let's we, tell we, us about absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, as I said, I opened my point. You know, this is a disruptive idea. You know, the, the U.S. economy, uh, you know, the, the oil and gas and, and fossil economy is, is very well established in this country. One of the big issues we're dealing with right now is just the uh, enormous transport of Balkan crude across this country down through New York, and we're, you know, all our emergency response people are are, are scheming what, or, or practicing in case of, and so we got to remember just how scaled up this this economy, this p piece of our economy is. And so the, the the I think inertia, just plain old inertia of change, is is difficult as as anything. And while I I certainly I'm a political science major. I study the founding, read books on the founding. I mean, these folks didn't put a government together that, that really um, was about rapid change. It's a very conservative structure, our government. A lot, you know, separation of powers, nobody has too much power. You know, they give states lots of power, federal government lots of power. All this delineation of who does what and where and how. Um, really puts inertia in the political system also. So I think the biggest challenge to some degree is just this, this inertia uh, that, that's in the system, um, especially a system that we now see throws around so much money. I'll be very specific. I was on the phone yesterday with Senator Jack Reed and, and talking about the election. And he just talked about how much money is, is at work now in the process of, of electing people and how it, it really makes it very difficult to, to move serious policy conversation forward. Uh, I think you all were tired of all the ads. So was everybody else. So we've got some uh, system level problems that really aren't about climate change. I mean, if you wanted to do big change in anything, it, they'd be there because there's going to be issues and interests that um, aren't going to like exactly what's coming. And I, I think that's, um, as much as the ideology and, and, and the specifics, there's this just dynamic that, that exists. I'm hopeful that uh, once the flywheel starts rolling, as we see this, uh, and I think we've seen this in New England, which is so, so powerful, once we see the it's it up to 88,000 jobs, the state's saying now? It will be 100,000 by the end of December. 100,000 jobs in, in, in Massachusetts around, around clean tech. Now, once that inertia starts happening on the other side, it can change the game. But if you ask me what's the big challenge right now, it's getting the ball moving. It's really getting it going. And, uh, you know, when we're in this lame duck time, um, but I, I can tell you without any equivocation, uh, the president is so committed to this, it, it makes me, I get frustrated when people go, well, this second term doesn't have any legacy issues associated with it. Well, this clean power plan and the climate action plan in general is a legacy issue. So um, I think you'll see us dig in hard and, and, and not from a political sense, but just from a this is necessary sense and, and, and do that, trying to, trying to deal with that inertia. Right. So I'd, I'd frame it, um, I'll take your disruptive and shift it. And I'd say, you know, I think part of the solution is what is disruptive is the do-nothing scenario, is yeah, the opportunity yeah. cost. And we, we continue to focus on the challenges of near-term you know, shifts and major shifts, transformational shifts in our infrastructure. Disruptive is not solving this, right? So of the 20 largest cities in the country by uh, gross domestic product, 10 of them in this country are coastal. They represent about 30% of the U.S. economy not including the through stuff. So that doesn't include all the stuff that goes into the port of LA, Long Beach, and winds up in Chicago. That's just the gross domestic product of those 10 coastal US cities, Boston, New York, Miami, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco. This is a national economic issue. This is a national security issue from a disruptive effect. I remember from Sandy, Sandy's disruptive. I remember from Sandy, Kurt calling me up on the phone asking for me to sign off on waivers to allow large-scale gasoline tankers to anchor in Boston Harbor 
and offload their gasoline to smaller barges to be able to service New York City. Because Thank we you, depend. By the way. Well, unfortunately, we didn't have to, and we signed off on it. But we actually depend on the major port in New York for the super tankers carrying gasoline. We had to, because of one storm, contemplate running the system in reverse. Right? That's disruptive. And thank goodness we didn't have a Rita following up a Katrina like we did with Sandy if we had you know, ships anchored in Boston Harbor. Um, so I think one is framing it around that. I think part of the solution is, is framing the terminology around the disruption of do nothing. Uh, and I think secondly, and this is you know, to the credit of uh, of taking all available opportunities from federal and state action is bringing resources and technology and opportunities to the cities and states that want to pilot them. Right? So the clean power rule, part of the motivation behind it is the success of Reggie and the success in California of saying market-based solutions can work. Right? And we can start to give flexibility to cities and states to solve their own solution set because we had Reggie. Uh, the reason we were able to do building energy disclosure in Boston is because we were building off of a 15-year-old system called Energy Star Portfolio Manager that was voluntary, that became so ubiquitous in Boston that when I went forward with this initial set of buildings, uh, which is about 1,000 buildings, uh, over 800 buildings were already using Portfolio Manager to voluntarily track their emissions. So the system's already out there, and it was because of taking, av you know, taking advantage of a federal program that was bipartisan, saying let's provide a tool for folks to actually measure and manage their energy on a voluntary basis. Uh, so I think we need to maximize those opportunities to create the case studies and the lessons learned to then scale up to large-scale policy. That's great. I want to pick up on this thread of disruption, because I think you made a great point, Brian, about the disruption that we're seeing as a result of the disruption we've created in our climate system. How much do you, uh, does the panel feel that this climate disruption is being taken into account in the cost of doing business, both from a policy perspective but in the private sector, and what might be done to, uh, to shore up that, uh, both shore up resilience and preparedness, but also uh, the awareness that this disruption is truly costly? I'll jump in on that one. Yeah, so I think hugely, I mean, the private sector is way ahead of government in this arena, um, and the, there was a big uh, analysis that just came out earlier this year, Risky Business, that looks at exactly that question. Um, and I think they're all, the, the business community is also out in front on the opportunities side of the equation as well as the risk management side of the equation. And I, I do agree that Sandy was transformative, and I, do li I live below sea level in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which is ground zero for Sandy. And it was, it was totally transformative to people's thinking, even in very red Staten Island. Uh, but I also think hope trumps fear, and we're not gonna win on a fear argument, and we, the hope uh, narrative that we have to tell because of the success stories is so powerful, but I think one of the challenges that we have to overcome is that that's a very fragmented story. The oil industry and the coal industry are huge powerhouses, very well funded, funding lots of campaigns. I'm sure you've heard of the Koch brothers. And they have a well-oiled machine. Uh, and the clean energy industry, perhaps, not is, is not well oiled. You know, I mean, just think about. It. I mean, remember Solyndra, and the Solyndra was the solar industry was like it's Solyndra, and the wind industry was like it's the solar industry, and energy efficiency was like it's renewables. No, they are they do not think of themselves as the clean energy industry, and there's a lot of small businesses, and they're just trying to make their widgets for the wind turbine. They don't have a government affairs office. They don't have a PR office. They are not, some of them even think like lobbying is kind of unsavory and they shouldn't be doing it. So they are not prepared to have an all out political battle with the oil and uh, coal industries that are so um, ubiquitous even in states that are not oil and coal states. And that's why you have a lot of these states, you have kind of a mentality that I'm a coal state. When you're not a coal state, you haven't been a coal state for 50 years, or you're a coal state in the sense of you have coal-fired power plants, but that means you're sending all of your energy dollars to West Virginia and Wyoming instead of keeping them in state. Like breaking out of this mentality and bringing the constituency that is already here and growing but not functioning as a constituency sort of up to a higher level. And it's not just on the business side. Mayors, 
uh, the real estate industry, the whole build, like what's happening at the city level with buildings, and it's not just the real estate industry, it's the building trades, and the banks, who's gonna invest in all those buildings. I mean, the, those players, when we were talking about federal climate legislation, were not at the table. They did not see climate as a business opportunity. Now, because of what Boston and some of the other cities um, that you mentioned are doing, now they're players, and those people do have political clout, and they are um, a little bit better positioned. But you know, we have to get all of those things to happen if we're going to really make, you know, do something as disruptive as this is. And I agree in both ways that, that this is a disruptive uh, endeavor. So just to you follow know. up on that, when we're thinking at the global level, um, you know, the challenge really is the distribution of these costs and benefits, and how to make the case that taking action that will cost something will also be beneficial. And the, you know, if it's just the US doing something, you're not going to actually solve the coastal infrastructure problem. You're going to need global collective action for that. Um, but it's easy to, be, to think of yourself as a free rider um, in that case. Uh, so I think there are some creative solutions that have come in to think about those problems and what could motivate people to take action. Um, you know, local jobs and clean energy is, is one of them. Another um, is thinking about uh, co-benefits for more traditional air pollutants like particulate matter, um, which there's some collective action that's going on on a global level uh, with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition that really is motivating taking action on warming agents like black carbon, um, which have substantial benefits domestically for human health, but will also help the global climate. So finding those win-win solutions that work on these different scales is really important. How important is it to have partnership with the private sector as a voice to complement some of these policies going forward? And how much has that been part of the strategy that you all have used? I think it's essential. Um, well, just take the auto industry itself. I mean. What we're seeing now with, with vehicles and all that you described is, is only because they're, they've sort of put their arms around this future and know what they need to do. And, um, and it was just mentioned, the strategic thinking at, at the top of some of the most important organizations in the world. I, I spent some time with the, uh, Linda Fisher, who is the former EPA deputy, served the government, served the public for many years, but is now head of sustainability at Dow. Dow's mindset is their corporate strategy going forward is to solve the climate problem to some degree. And there's a whole other dimension of work around uh, sustainability and green chemistry and biofuel and all kinds of different technologies that are out there that they're out there to push. Now, to be fair, they're going to do it in a way that makes them money. So for those of you who say, well, you know, Dow isn't working in their self-interest, but indeed, in the end of the day, that's a pretty powerful driver. If you have large, complex organizations, big multinationals who are driving the system because it's in their self-interest. Because we know what the Cokes are thinking, or we know what the uh, uh, AEP is thinking, that, who owns those coal plants. They're thinking in their interest. And our, our government is a lot about that. I mean, when you think about the founding and the, and the way economic interests are, are kind of what this country's been about in terms of its government, uh, activity, you need that balance. You, you need that hard driving, we can do this and make money at it and be prosperous doing it. And, and that can, you know, that's a lot of what the culture of this country is about. It's about the economy, stupid, You've, it's been overplayed. What, what was the number one thing everybody said coming out of the polls yesterday? Oh, it's the economy. You know, it's got to line up with that. Or, or we, won't, uh, we won't be successful. And I think having big, corp, big drivers, uh, big economic interest driving is, is, is essential. And I think that's probably true in Boston, too. Uh, it's got to be that way. Yeah, so I, I think we're, and we haven't spent enough time talking to the clients and the end customers. Right? So oftentimes, at a, you know, Boston's at the end of uh, every major energy pipeline. We are a significant client. We need to start acting as a customer. Uh, in addition to a regulator, because frankly, in the energy world, we have very little to no regulatory authority. Even though I have energy in my title and people call me when the power goes out, I have no direct control to get your power back on, right? <laughs> I can't find anyone, I can't tell people, but the reality is we are a giant customer. We have 16 million square feet under management, we have 300 buildings, uh, we control easements, we actually control the franchise rights. Uh, so we need to have conversations with customers about what is valuable to them around green energy. And I would highlight, you know, there. 
the, we've spent too much time talking about it from a climate dynamic and a greenhouse gas dynamic and a cost dynamic and not enough about uh, the value of resiliency and reliability uh, and not enough about the value of predictability. Right? It is not just a pure how much are you paying next year or next month. It is how consistent is that curve. Uh, you know, we're experiencing, as folks in the room probably know, a significant price spike in electricity this winter because of our alliance, our over-reliance on natural gas as a single fuel source. Uh, we, for those who bought futures and are buying from wind power from solar, aren't going to experience that. Right? That, that predictability of prices right. is equally important to major businesses, uh, and so is reliability. And if you talk to folks after Sandy or from other major disruptions, the value of having the power on, or another way of valuing that is the amount of money that private sector companies and landlords will put into backup power generation is an indicator of the value of reliability that they're building into their economic models. Two great points. One, that cities and units of government can leverage their buying power. The other, that we have to think about the co-benefits of reliability and resilience. So it strikes me that the title of this conference is the uh, climate and the crowds. And um, so I want to invite questions both from Twitter and from folks in the room to ask of our panelists. Um, the floor is open for, um, for that. And while people are kind of making their way, I want to throw another question out, which is really about this question of the crowd. How much does it matter? How much has engaging the crowd been a formative aspect of the policies that you all have seen succeed? I'll just use a number and shut up. We have 1.4 million comments on the Clean Power Plan already. And we got months to go. Part, I'm sorry, we've got weeks to go. The, the comment period's not closed yet. So we'll probably get another half a million before it closes. That's a lot of crowd engagement. And can you imagine the people who have to go through all those comments <laughs> and write response to comments? Sounds like uh, a data analytics so, project. So the, the engagement has been unprecedented on this issue, and the crowd matters enormously. Hopefully, um, oh, I know we'll see a balance of comments there. We'll see some hard edge critiques, too. But uh, no, that, that's very, very important to, to our work at EPA to get that kind of, uh, of, of feedback and, and just, just awareness. We've worked pretty hard at it, and, and uh, hopefully it'll, it'll serve the role going forward. Great. I'm going to ask others to hold their thoughts on that, because since people were quick in moving to the mics, and we'll take a question from here first. And the other gentleman got Oh, was first. first. OK, thank you. You're so fair. <laughs> We appreciate that. Youth before uh, age. <laughs> uh, Peter Joseph with Citizens Climate Lobby. Our proposal is uh, the little engine that could carbon fee and dividend. It's been a great panel and a great opportunity to look deep into a wide range of expertise. However, unless I missed it, I didn't hear anyone mention market-based mechanisms using carbon pricing. And my question is, how would the EPA's life be easier? How would uh, an administrator in a city's life be better? How would a large environmental organization's goals be better met? And international cooperation, what would it all look like if there was a federal level, U.S., revenue neutral, carbon fee, steadily rising, steeply rising, with border adjustments to incentivize similar activities with other countries? How would okay. that help you? Hey, I think we've got it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Dale. So, well, I would just say, I mean, the, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is, a, is basically, I would call it cap and invest as opposed to cap and dividend. So there's a pollution cap. You sell those pollution permits, and you invest the money in the solutions. I actually prefer, and there's lots of different ways you can do it to make it rev revenue neutral, but... You know, if you invest in energy efficiency, you're getting $3 of benefits on your dollar. So I would say that's a bigger value to the people who would otherwise just get a dollar check in the mail. Um, but the, you know, you can structure things different ways, and there's tools, carbon tax, the, the uh, cap and dividend, cap and invest, and the pollution standard where the states will have the decision about which they could use that mechanism. They could use any mechanism they want as long as they deliver the end result that That's meets right. the, the Clean Air Act standards. Um, and to us, at, from an environmental perspective, is we want to get the steepest reductions at the lowest cost, and then the, sort of the devil is in the details. So you want to just make sure that those details are right, because that's, I mean, there's lots of uh, different ways to craft any of those kinds of policies. 
Right. So the, the, the lesson is a market-based mechanism can actually have some success. I think the, the question was pointedly about a federal national carbon tax, which I think is something you know a lot of us would like. I think it requires an act of Congress. Uh, and I think that's part of the reality we're in. Um, others might want to weigh in, but I want to make sure we get in some more questions. So I'm going to go over here. Thank you. I'm Timothy Damon. My proposal is make our economic reasoning consistent with intergenerational justice. So I'm very eager to get your thoughts on, you all touched upon the importance of making the economic case and the economic arguments. The problem is that we're very short-sighted in how we make these analyses. So what opportunities do you see in your various areas of operation and policy for building more of an appreciation for the future value of today's decisions into that process, for example, through how we take care of the discount rate in our decision making or other avenues? Great question. Sorry, uh, two thoughts on that. Um, and they're both from the preparedness mindset, but it gets you to that visioning. So one, uh, a year ago, uh, one of our post-Sandy um, changes, uh, initiatives and policies, was to now require in our design review process at the BRA that uh, projects identify their lifespan and then discuss in their design review how they're prepared for the expected climate over their full lifespan. Because as city government, I care not only about how viable your project is in year one, but if you're building a million square foot office tower on the waterfront, how viable are you in year 70? Uh, and that's begun robust conversations because currently, frankly, our zoning and building code is not set up to even have that conversation about uh, why, how will the building be viable in a changing condition and a changing climate. Um, we need to take that same principle in all of our major capital decisions that we're going to be living with intergenerationally. Uh, we don't currently have an explicit criterion in transmission line decisions uh, at FERC or at ISO around resiliency. There are no explicit criterion, yet we're making decisions around transmission line siting uh, and on major investments in infrastructure that will be living for decades without that criterion of what is the most cost-effective way of providing a resilient infrastructure. Uh, so you know, one of the things we need to do as city, as city and state and, and federal officials and advocacy groups is make sure that these major capital decisions that are oftentimes made quietly through opaque processes are explicitly addressing long-term preparedness as an issue. Oftentimes it's that win-win, that the solution of um, you know, distributed generation, of distributed sources uh, of energy uh, are oftentimes uh, lower carbon intensive, uh, provides with both the resiliency and solving climate change. Great. Have we answered the question? I, I might help to get others to chime in. I mean, how do we really do this? How do we uh, embed a lower discount rate of the future, of future generations into policy? Is that realistic? Is that something we can actually do in this political reality? Well, I think the we live in the world of uh, some of our regulations have to really stand up to a benefit cost calculation. Uh, 316B under the Clean Water Act, which is about uh, cooling water, that sort of thing. So can we accommodate this under traditional benefit cost thinking? Um, I think for the most part, we probably can. Um, if, we, if, we value, if we value other benefits, as, as was discussed, the public health benefits around this are enormous. Um, there are enormous benefits around the kind of future we, we will build. I think the biggest problem is painting that future. Um, and, and that's really up to people your age. Um, you know, the, the baby boom, we all know why suburbia exists. It was really a creation of future messaging the auto industry did through the 40s and 50s and got legislation done. They, they painted a future uh, they could see with, with, with automobiles and big highways and all that we see that's not very sustainable going forward. And I think that, to me, is where the focus has to be. Can we create a values conversation that, that gives folks an, an idea what this future might look like? And, and, and to me, that, that's where it's got to go. I, 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 I just think getting hung up on the discount rate going forward and decision making, um, you know, I think a lot of companies are way over that in terms of their future investments. I, I, I see GE investing enormous amounts of money in sustainable technology, not based on a short uh, traditional benefit cost analysis, but, but a sense of, you know, big market sectors they want to be in going forward and, and the problem they see that's going to emerge. And 
I, I think that's where the conversation has to be. It's just a louder voice about the future you want. And, and, and then try to hammer home this aging baby boomer group. You're going to have to be loud. <laughs> you really are going to have to be loud. There's a big demographic uh, initiative uh, mega trend going on, and it, it's a hard one to get over because they're retiring and they're thinking about things other than 50 years down the road. You, you know, it's hard. Let's bring in a question from over here. Thank you so much for all of your insight. Uh, my name is Regina, and I have a question specifically for Kurt, and maybe other people can answer too. And it's about the 111D regulations. I read one of the comments, the, one of the many comments you suggested or mentioned, and that was Energy Developers NRG, their comment. And um, they had said. I haven't read them, but that's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I could just tell you the basic idea was that they were concerned with the interim targets, so the targets yeah. that people have to, the, yeah, that states that. have to get, you know, from 2020 to 2029, right. saying that those targets are so um, aggressive that it would lock in the cheaper options like natural gas versus um, renewables, and that what we would end up would be having a lot more natural gas yep. than renewables as they would like. And I could completely see arguments that support or don't support that. And I was just wondering if you had any insight on that. I do have a little insight, yeah. and I think my colleague Cynthia Green is here somewhere. She informed me on the way in that um, the air leadership, uh, System Administrator McCabe, is, is just today, I think 3 o'clock today, right about now, you're, we're put, putting forth uh, technical guidance uh, about the rule, uh, which address some of what you're talking about. Um, we are listening very hard to those issues. Uh, and I think this guidance, which sort of adds to our thinking that was in the rule itself, would perhaps show a responsiveness to some of the issues you're talking about. So uh, I'm, I'm saying what you're saying is valid, and, and there's issues there, and, and the program is listening very hard. This rule, um, again, the, the kind of input we've had is unbelievable. Uh, you, you can't appreciate how much our states have helped us think about it. Uh, just the issue of how to work with existing market mechanisms like Reggie has been a big conversation, too. So we'll eventually have to figure out how to take our measure and link it up with their measure, which is a mass measure versus an uh, intensity measure. So all of this is in play. And, and I just want to emphasize, people are trying to figure all these things out, and those comments are very important. OK, so it's the technical assistance document? Is that what you said? Or? Te yes. OK. It, right. It's out, like, now. Okay. I think you could go online to EPA and actually start to see it. And I imagine it would take a little bit of reading. Okay. But uh, we're working. OK, sounds good. Thank Great. you. And do we have a question from online? Great. Yes, I'm going to ask a question from Twitter. This is from Sonny Morgan. And um, so he was asking about a carbon tax kind of as an, as an international instrument. And so I wonder if we could speak about that. And then also perhaps um, looking at different levels. I know some states are lobbying for carbon taxes, um, so on different uh, political levels. So, uh, from an international perspective, um, you know there there are a, a, a variety of different international instruments. Uh, for example, in Europe, um, you, know, you have a European trading system. So these these inter these economic instruments are not purely at domestic level. So you can see them emerge. The challenge is um, that you would have to set them up. You would have to have um, regulatory advisory bodies and figure out exactly how it would work. Um, so, you know, there's no one particular tax authority that can uh, do a carbon tax at a global level. Um, you have to figure out what kind of a, of a system would need and how it would work with each of the individual authorities. Uh, so it's, a, it's complex, but we do see some, uh, some examples emerging uh, from the um, history of the Framework Convention on Climate Change as well as the European uh, trading system. Yeah, and there are examples at the state and local level as well. So Massachusetts currently has uh, a carbon tax um, advisory task force underway looking at, um, looking at whether or not there's a family of some participants in the room. Um, so, and there's, they've been very supportive of state reps and senators on exploring that at the state level. And one of the things I found interesting is there are viable international um, examples at the city level. So Tokyo for years has had uh, a carbon tax, uh, which I think is also an interesting model. British Columbia. British Columbia, right. Yeah. right. 
I just want to say, I don't think there's any disagreement that a tax or a fee or broadly applied, accelerated, would probably be more efficient than what we're going to do using the Clean Air Act. That's, that's not, that's not um, a controversy. The issue is, does anybody here think Congress is going to act on a carbon bill in a foreseeable future, at least, at least right now? So the answer is, well, well maybe okay, you can. We're gonna but, but, and that's fine. What I'm saying is, you know, under the authorities we have, we can use the Clean Air Act, and we intend to do so. And that, that's the strength of what we're doing. Okay, we're going to need, yeah, we're going to need to close up with a final question, but I'll ask the panelists to all chime in with any final words they have. Hopefully, we can jujitsu the final question. I'm told our time is up, even though this is clearly a lively conversation with folks in the back with things to say. I, I agree that, that that inertia is a huge thing in business as usual. Is you know, is one of our biggest problems, both at the individual level and at all levels. Um, I'm particularly interested in transportation because back in '75, EPA said we couldn't, you know, widen highways anymore, and yet we, you know, we've just finished doing that. Massachusetts just added three cents on the, gal on the gas tax, which we do every 20 years or so, but we keep raising, you know, transit fares. So we're going in the opposite direction of what we need to do. So I'm wondering if, if there's, and I know that the miles per gallon is good, but if we drive more because now it's cheaper, that's not so good. So, for example, is the city of Boston going to do something bold and step, you know, all those people that are driving into Boston and, you know, and, and lowering the quality of life for Boston residents, even though the Boston residents are on the T, are you going to do something about trying to stop that? I, I don't know so, what's happening with NRDC about transportation so issues, but the question you know, is, it, how can trans? What more can be done to disincentivize so uh, inefficient transportation? There's so but, much greenhouse gases associated with transportation, and it's it's a more amorphous issue, and it's a little tougher to get your hands around. Okay, so I'll ask for thank you. We'll ask for some final comments um, on that question, and anything else that you might want to say to close us out. Yeah, I mean, I'll just quickly say, I mean, for, on the transportation side, you've got vehicle efficiency, so we have the car standards, the trucks are coming. Then you've got fuel diversity. You go to the pump, guess what your choice is? Gasoline. What about electricity? And we, are, we, we have a plan for cleaning up the electric sector. So if we expand electrification of vehicles, you could see how that could really make a dent uh, in the transportation sector emissions. And then, of course, you have what we call vehicle miles traveled, smart growth. How do we build out and rebuild our cities in a much smarter way and counter that, uh, the, the bill of goods we were sold with suburbanization um, back in the day? So those are hu three huge chunks of work that we have to uh, focus on as much as the power plant side of the equation in order to really win. And I think there are, you know, we do see things at the city level that are really innovative, and the challenge there is how do you scale them when the cities are so different from one another and take the lessons learned from the cities who are at the forefront and figure out how to customize them. And again, on the building side, we are learning how to do that, bring the lessons from New York, from Boston, to you know, Houston and Kansas City. We're doing that. We need to add on to that the transportation side of the equation, because I do think that's the hardest nut to crack the um, the way that we develop and reducing the amount of time you have to actually spend in your car, even if it's super efficient, even if it's electric or hybrid electric. Great. Any last comments, and including on this issue of how are we going to bring in the crowds? What's the role of the crowd in forming these climate policies going forward? So I'll, I'll try to blend that with the transportation. Yeah. Um, so we, we have begun a mobility vision process. Actually, I'll start. Two years ago, we launched uh, Complete Streets in Boston, which was uh, the the principle, which is a new principle in Boston, that the car is no longer king, that it's about moving people and moving goods. Uh, and we have started a two-year mobility visioning process uh, to uh, set out the plan using the Complete Streets Guides as our toolbox um, to, to get it exactly that issue of uh, getting folks outside of single occupancy vehicles and getting folks outside of vehicles in general. So we have a 30-year bike uh, network plan. Uh, we want to talk about urban walkability, and we have targets to both reduce vehicles' miles traveled, as well as, and you touched on this with smart growth, increase our residency rate. And by residency rate, I mean the percentage of jobs in Boston that are met by people who live in Boston. Uh, and that number can move with affordable housing policies and middle-income housing policies and uh, public safety uh, improvements and education improvements. And we've actually increased that since the early 2000s. It was around 32%. It's now at 39%. 
of jobs in Boston are met by folks who live in Boston. I'd like to see that continue to improve, and we're going to set real targets uh, associated with that. One of the keys related to crowds, and I'll, I'll talk about sort of crowdsourcing, is access to information. Uh, when we launched, as an example, when we launched the Night Owl service for Mass Transit a few years ago, and you were standing at the T, and even if the T, you know, is operating at two or three in the morning, but if you missed it, it was a half hour until the next one, and you didn't know, no one wants that service. Now, because of IT and because of communicating with folks, uh, you can look up on your iPhone and say, it's coming in seven minutes. I got time to, you know, finish this drink and get down to the station and get it in real time. And I think there, I am tremendously excited about the connection between crowdsourcing and IT processes and developing those technologies and then being much more real time about information to solve some of the transportation challenges, which we've had the infrastructure, it's just the real time utilization of it has been a challenge to make attractive to folks. So one of the things I think about when I think about the benefits of, of crowds is, is really the global nature of these communication technologies. And it's possible to talk across countries and across um, situations. And thinking about some of the challenges in balancing the present and the future, uh, we're not just talking about getting out of your gas guzzler. We're talking about turning the lights on in a lot of countries and having access to electricity and having food sources and having sort of um, you know, basic development needs. So having that conversation and being able to have that conversation emerging um, when you're talking about these real trade-offs and sustainability issues as we move forward as a global community, I think is really powerful. Thank you. I think that's a great way to end. I want to thank our panelists and thank everyone for being here and um, hope we can build on these innovations for the future.